I'm joined by uh, Olivia Wilde. Uh, Olivia, thanks for being here. Oh, it's an honor. I'm so happy. And thanks for uh, picking this double feature, uh, which we'll get to uh, momentarily. You came into this business as an actor. Uh, you're a director now. Do you do you still consider yourself an actor, director, or are you a director, actor? Oh, good question. Well, I started as a casting assistant. Uh, well, I'm assuming you're not doing a lot of that anymore. <laughs> No, hopefully directing mostly now. Uh, you enjoy directing, not so much, more than acting, but directing, you, you feel like this is it. This is the thing you really want to do. It's the best job in the world. Did your experience as an actor, it must have informed how you are as a director? Completely, because I feel like I, I'm multilingual. Part of directing is just communicating, which I think acting really is what that, that's about, is listening and communicating. And um, yeah, I, I think that acting should be an essential part of the directing training process. 2019, Booksmart. Yes. Uh, 2022, uh, Don't Worry, Darling. Mm -hmm. This is TCM. I'm convinced that I'm going to say move over, darling. Uh, but <laughs> Don't Worry, Darling. Both well received. Did you know that you wanted to to direct throughout the body of your acting career? Yes, I took every opportunity to shadow directors and DPs. And, you know, as an actor, you are not privy to so much of what makes a production work. There is this kind of arbitrary separation between actors and crew, when really we're all crew. And I started to kind of blur those lines and say, like, well, hang on, how, who built this set? How does that happen? And so then I started learning from the production designers and art directors and started like really asking questions. I mean, I, I think of the people who took time out of their busy schedules to answer this actress's questions over and over and over again. I'm so grateful because I started to understand what it really takes to make a movie. And that is so exciting. You've programmed an intriguing uh, double feature uh, for us. Uh, the connection seems quite clear. Uh, in a couple of hours, we'll have uh, uh, the 1975 uh, documentary, one of the seminal documentaries of its era, uh, Grey Gardens from the Maisels Brothers. But first, from Warner Brothers in 1958, uh, Auntie May with Rosalind and Russell. Why'd you program these films uh, together? What draws you to them? Well, I love that the connection between these two films, even though they seem on the surface very different, one's a documentary, one is like classic Warner Brothers 50s Technicolor film, but they're about eccentric women. Yeah. They're about true individuals. And one almost seems like the sort of darker real life version of the other. As a child, when I first saw Rosalind Russell in Nancy Mame, I understood that it was about someone bucking the confines of society and a true individual. And it was about um, a kind of decadence that uh, was something that I understood was aspirational. And I feel that Great Gardens is about people who lived that life at some point and maybe in their minds continue to do so. Or this is the life that they actually want and we just don't understand it because it doesn't fit sort of our expectations. I think that's the heart of Andy Mame is that she is living a life that is totally rejected by society, which is kind of the point Morton DaCosta makes over and over in the film that everyone thinks she's outrageous. But of course, as the audience, you root for her. Give people who maybe haven't seen it, or, or yes. in TCM sense, people yes. who've seen it 15 times, yes. something that strikes you that, that maybe they could look for. Rosalind Russell made this film when she was 50 years old and allowed the world and certainly Hollywood to understand that a middle-aged woman could still really crush. And she is so fantastic in the role and I think that the film is kind of revolutionary. I think that what they did in terms of the opulence of the production design and the character development that is really pretty unusual. And they really are making fun of society in a way that at the time was still pretty ballsy. Now, what I will say is that the film is a fantasy in that it treats, you know, the depression as a kind of minor speed a bump. Small roadblock, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> in the film, yeah, that's right. her, like, loyal servants still stay with her unpaid. Right. And, you know, like, there, it is, it is a fantasy. But in a way, it also is an incredibly loving portrait um, about family. And that's another connection the two films obviously have. Um, but I think Auntie Mame is the best of Hollywood opulence of that era. From costumes to production design to the performances, it just blows it out of the water.
Olivia, thanks very much. We'll talk more uh, after the movie. But uh, here it is now from Warner Brothers in 1958, starring Rosalind Russell, directed by Morton DaCosta, written by Betty Comden and Adolph Green. This is Anti May. I am joined once again by uh, director Olivia Wilde, uh, who uh, programmed tonight's uh, double feature, uh, Anti Mame, we just saw. We'll have Grey Gardens coming up uh, in a little bit. Jan Hiltzik, who uh, played young Patrick. Yes. Taking nothing away from older Patrick, but but young Patrick. And and Jan had this role on uh, uh, on Broadway, too, with, with Roz Russell. He's yes, so good. which I think you can tell. They yeah. obviously love each other. He feels very safe with her. They have such great banter. And he really created a character. He's hilarious in the film yeah. as the kind of perfect child yeah. like this is the child all our grandparents really wanted to have yeah. that like when he opens his gift and she's given him like long pants for his birthday and he's like wow we auntie mame can i try them on now can i and he like <laughs> runs away and she's like oh dream and i would think like that is uh, <laughs> yeah, again a fantasy long pants long not, pants not and the, i was like man not the gift kids wow. today really get excited no about. my kids wouldn't be as psyched yeah. but i think it's really interesting because the end of the film is of course victorious because she's found a rich boyfriend it is i'm sorry it is a little abrupt when he falls off the cliff. He falls off the cliff. <laughs> yeah. And yet it's like, she doesn't really mind. It's like she's had this adventure with him. She's kind of okay. In the very end, you get the sense like, she knows she's happy because she wants an adventure buddy. When I was a kid, I was like, I want to go live with her. I want to leave school and go like hiking. Sure, with someone who thinks Labor Day is in November. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's in the middle I mean, of the opening scene, her first scene of the cocktail party so good. is one of the greatest scenes yeah. of all time. Where it tells you, I mean, we learn in two minutes. Like exactly. Everything about this character that's going to be incredibly consistent through what it would two, two hours, 20 minutes. Exactly. Yeah. She announces from the top of the stairs there's more gin coming. She doesn't know who the party's for. It's right. a constant <laughs> influx of guests. And I think that she is revolutionary in that aspect because at the time, an unmarried woman without children would have been a bit of a pariah. Roz Russell always played I strong know. characters so effectively. Exactly. You know. To get back to Beauregard's death. Yes. When he falls yes. off the mat. It strikes me that Morton DaCosta was an interesting choice because we're making a movie now. They could shoot yeah. something. They could yeah. shoot a slip. Obviously, they're not going to show a, a terrible death scene. But clearly to me, and I don't know this to be true, but clearly to me, it was handled exactly the same way it was on the stage. On stage, it's With a so shot true. of her and the sound, which is just how I imagine that would have happened. It's so true. I wonder how much they learned from what worked on Broadway. Right. I think about this in every kind of ad film adaptation of a play. It's like, what was clearly the way that the audience got the joke in the most effective way and that they then mimicked? I think there's no better way to tell that story that wouldn't make it m tragic in a distracting way. The point right. is... Right. We, don't, we don't want it to feel too tragic. Exactly. To break the flow of, yeah. of how we feel about her and this movie. Yeah. And I think like we're a little bit relieved that she doesn't have to deal with his family and all right. that anymore. Um, they were great. They yeah. were great. Yeah. He has a really problematic line earlier in the film, which really struck stuck out to me the last time I watched it, where she says about her kind of staff in the apartment, she's like, this is my family. And he says like, oh, I have fields and fields of family. And yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah. Beauregard, <laughs> Bo, no. Bo. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. when he falls off the cliff, there's part of you that's like, I'm okay with yeah. it. <laughs> he is not set up to be this perfect angelic nope, character. That's right. He's just someone who allows her to live this to kind live of the fantastic life. life. We, right. But they do build the tension of him slowly going higher and higher yeah, up the totally. mountain. Yeah, so you do. know yeah. something yeah. bad's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, totally. Olivia, great stuff. Thanks very much. Let's, uh, let's do another one. Great. Uh, stay with us. Uh, Olivia Wilde has programmed the second half of tonight's double feature as well. When we return from 1975, a seminal documentary of its era, Grey Gardens, next on TCM. Next on TCM, Grey Gardens, then the breaking point, and later, Wild Bill Hickok rides. TCM's tall in the saddle tonight. Ben Mankiewicz, joined once again by director Olivia Wilde. Olivia, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. We talked about this earlier for our first movie, Anti Mame. We have the second part of our double feature tonight uh, that you programmed, uh, uh, Grey Gardens from 1975. Uh, we discussed uh, your, you came to people's attention as an actor, became a director. But let's go back a little further. Where are you from? 
I'm from Washington, D.C. Where'd you go to school up until eighth grade? <laughs> I went to Georgetown Day School. Georgetown Day School, that's interesting. Uh, so you left, can, you went kindergarten through eighth? Kindergarten through eighth. I went kindergarten through twelfth. Um, <laughs> so amazing. It's a great school. It really formed who I am. Uh, you Same. are the most famous person to uh, have gone to GDS, just to be clear. So um, proud. Father Irish, uh, he's a, a journalist. Your mother's a journalist. Yes. You visited Ireland all the time as a kid. Yeah, I'm a dual citizen, and I felt just as Irish as American. And, uh, yeah, my, my parents were both war correspondents and documentarians and authors. And that was kind of how I discovered documentaries, because our basement of our house in D.C. was an editing suite. No, oh, really? So it was wow. like the old yeah. avid. So I grew up to the sounds of like... <laughs> <laughs> they were cutting. My mom worked at 60 Minutes for years. years right. It was fascinating to be a kid sitting on the carpet watching them cut these pieces. And it was how I fell in love with documentaries. And documentaries, such a big part of your life growing up. So yes. it makes some sense that the film we have here from the Maisel's Brothers in 1975, Grey Gardens. And I think Grey Gardens is one of the great documentaries. And the Maisel's Brothers essentially just became flies on the wall where they were observing these two incredibly eccentric women. So they definitely are flies on the wall. We're going to talk about whether it was exploitative. We'll wait to have that right. at the end. It's an interesting conversation yeah. anyway. But while they do make themselves flies on the wall, the idea is to shoot everything. They also, within, as you'll see, within the first 45 seconds or a minute, they make their presence no. Yes. To the audience. Like they, they, the second voice you hear in the documentary is David Maisel's. And so you, you, they're like, oh, they're here and they're shooting. And the fact that they are shooting is acknowledged. And I think that's a very critical it's, it's decision. It's absolutely yeah. critical. And I think that they make it clear and they're acknowledging that there is an effect they're having on this, this environment, which very rarely has visitors. So just by the nature of entering the space, they're changing the chemistry. And it is still incredibly restrained in terms of what they capture. You see that they let this um, kind of, they let this performance happen around them, but acknowledging that in a way they are being performed for. Right, right. They, are, they, are, they are affecting it. Yes. But, but what we still see is, is authentic. I mean, it's really something. I don't want to give too much away, and obviously people will pick it up right away, but this is a 77-year-old woman and her 55-year-old daughter in a house they've lived in in East Hampton full-time. For yes. This is not their summer home. What is incredible is they're incredibly unencumbered by any sort of societal expectations in the way that they dress or undress. Big Edie is often seen sunbathing nude or the way that they dance and sing. They don't live by the kind and, of... And even by the way they argue with each other. Oh, by the way they like, argue. A lot of arguing, yeah. And, and yet, you know, the way that they just live on their own kind of clock, this house has... 29 rooms, they stay together in a small bedroom. Yeah. The love story is really profound. It's also significant that it was made by brothers, the film, I mean, oh, about yeah. this family, yeah. a mother and daughter. There's a kind of family affair sort of intimacy that you feel from both sides of the camera. Before we uh, uh, show the film, uh, uh, connect it as you did in the first film, like why you programmed it with Auntie Mame, which we had earlier tonight. I believe that Grey Gardens is almost the, um, what could be argued as the kind of like, real life version of Auntie Mame. I believe that in at least Big Edie's head, she is living as Mame. They're both stories about eccentric women. If we women. see squalor, Big Edie doesn't, doesn't see Not that at, at all. all. Yeah. Little Edie is frustrated mostly by the kind of like politics of the neighborhood. Right. You know, she wants to go and live in the city and live this amazing kind of free life, which she eventually did after the film. Yeah, she says, uh, any little rattle, even on 10th Avenue. Would yeah. be better. <laughs> yes, they're real New Yorkers. That's right, what I love they're about real them. New Yorkers. But I, you know, one of the famous lines from Auntie Mame is, life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death. And I think you can imagine that line being said by Big Edie in oh, Grey Gardens. 100%. Uh, let's watch it now from the Maisels Brothers, Albert and David, 1975. This is Grey Gardens. I am back with uh, director Olivia Wilde. Olivia, thanks for being here. So great to be here. This has been such a lovely conversation. Olivia programmed uh, uh, tonight's double feature. We had Auntie Mame. We just saw Grey Gardens. So th there's a lot of arguing in this. I, I don't like it when people talk over each other. Uh -huh. Like in my life, when my daughter and my wife, I'm like, stop! <laughs> but I, you get used to it. It's part of the 
communication of little, and they're almost like having separate, because they're just, I mean, they're saying full sentences while the other person they is talking. They can talk. hear each other. Yeah, That's what's amazing. They can hear each other while they're speaking. Right, they're sort of responding, and yeah, they're... It's, I, I always think when I watch this film, you could never write this. I mean, maybe like Robert Altman. You could just, you, it would be really tricky. <laughs> it would be a Robert Altman film. It would film. be a Robert Altman film, but like, it'd be really tricky to perform. Any actor would really struggle. And of course, they have made yep. narrative versions of this film, but I think what's so hard to nail is that they are completely completely in their own heads, and yet they're completely connected. They don't miss a beat of each other's that, words. That last fight that we see, their last argument, that one's a little bit heartbreaking. And, and you know, of course, we don't know what's true. The filmmakers never explain that for us. That's right. We, we never... don't go to any sort of like footage or photography or any sort of text or any voiceover that explains what really happened. No, it we, all matter. we get is old newspaper clippings that they just sort right. of pan over. That's it. They each have their own narrative. Yeah. We don't know if Big Edie was protecting Little Edie, which I always get the sense that Might Little Edie needed to come home and be protected by her mother just as much as her mother needed to be protected by her daughter. But that fight, it's an example example of uh, leaving the audience in a place of, of curiosity. We don't really need to know. It's sort of their business. What we know is what their, their versions of the narrative are now. The sense of who the Maisel's brothers were comes through in how they found Big Edie and Little Edie. So yes. Lee Radswell, who was Jackie Kennedy's sister and a cousin to Little Edie, hired them to do a story on the Bouvier family. Yes. Right? And in that process, the Maisel's brothers met Big Edie and Little Edie, <laughs> and they were like, mm, mm. how are we going to do this? Like any great filmmaker, right. yeah. they pivoted towards the more interesting story. And Lee Radswell was like, no. She kept all that footage. Oh, yeah. Right? And so they had to go, they went back and started they went, over. They raised yeah. money and they went back. Yeah. I think it's very hard to do that now. I think often when you go raise money to make a documentary, people want to know the story and the structure and they kind of want to know the ending. When the whole point of the art form is to ask questions without knowing the ending. You sound like you probably have a documentary in you. Yes. At some point. Yeah. Yes, I would love to. I would love to. But I think it takes real courage to shoot one like the Maisels. I don't know if I could do that. I think I'm too heavy-handed. I think I would try to manipulate what the audience was feeling as opposed to just, like, letting it happen. There's been a lot of criticism of them. I mean, first of all, they're acknowledged as seminally important documentarians. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, they weren't flies on the wall as much as they would have had you believe. There are those who think that this was exploitative. Sure. I take it you, I, I can tell you're, you're not in that camp. I'm not because I don't, I, I don't watch the film and think and laugh at them in a way. Uh, that, there's some stuff that's funny, but I don't feel like I'm laughing at them. No, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, quite inspired by them as as people. I understand that they've been dealt a really kind of unfair hand in life. I watch it and wish that, you know, they could have Auntie Mame's riches so that they could, like, live the dreams that they deserve. I don't want them to change anything about themselves except not be forced to move out of their house because it's been condemned. Would you feel like if somebody gave them two and a half million dollars, they'd still live in the same room? I think they would absolutely live in the same room, but they would maybe live without the stress of being told they have to leave. I mean, the fleas that they yeah. talk about in the film, like, yeah. oh, this house is full of fleas. I mean, little Edie constantly derides the house, the conditions in the house. She's saying, I can't take it, I can't take it, I can't take it here anymore. So it's... It's something that she wants to draw attention to, that, that, that she wants to break out of this, this cage. And yet there's Big Edie saying, it's beautiful, and I had a beautiful marriage, and I have a beautiful house. It's so interesting. They just have two different perspectives on the exact same life, and yet this is the only way they can really live. I, I think that it's complex in the way that any good film should be. It leaves you asking questions as opposed to having conclusions. And I understand the argument that there's something about it that's really sad. Yeah, there's definitely something about it that's sad. But I I also celebrate any any illustration or depiction of, of individuality like that. And I think there's something really romantic about their kind of decadent individualism. And I, I feel inspired by it. Olivia Wilde, this has been uh, uh, fascinating. I've learned so much. This has been one of the great conversations I've had. Uh, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you so much. It's such an honor. Thanks again. Really so wonderful. Uh, stay with us. Olivia is done for the night, but the movies, of course, continue on Turner Classic Movies. And as always, they are uncut and commercial free. Next on TCM, The Breaking Point. Then Wild Bill Hickok rides. And later, The Guardsman. 
TCM stands at attention tonight.